I will talk about uh, my research journey from last few years and the journey will be about how to make our modern processors faster, energy efficient and at the end secure. So this is a, a conventional or maybe th this is the computing stack that you will see in uh, even in the modern computing systems. So as computer science engineers, you take problems, write algorithms, you code them using different programming languages, compiler does its job. Finally, you put that code into a, uh, you know, engine that understands what you have written and uh, operating system does something to make sure that, th that they are actually uh, taken care uh, in, an, in an optimized way and finally your code runs at a place which is called the uh, microarchitecture okay so so microarchitecture is a subfield in computer architecture i will talk about that uh, what's the difference and this is where all the uh, things that i do the key takeaway or the you know the key theme for computer systems research or in general computer architecture research is it's a game of trade-offs. So it's actually a two different uh, things that you want to optimize, right? Let's say you want to get into IIT Bombay at the same time you want to watch Netflix for 15 hours, right? They're the trade-offs. And uh, most of the time, these trade-offs are conflicting. So if you want high performance, you have to pay the price. You have, if you need highly secure systems, you need to pay the price, right? It's not for free, right? So my goal or my theme of research is to play with these trade-offs. Right, and how to find out what is called a sweet spot in this trade off. So, you play around with all these trade offs that are possible, then finally, you say, okay, this is good enough for my system. Okay, so we'll uh, go through that. As you already said, performance, power, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we'll actually pick few metrics of interest in this talk mostly performance, power, and bit of security. Okay, so before I jump into the technicalities, I said microarchitecture is different from computer architecture. So microarchitecture is actually an abstraction. So if you look at here, uh, this is your famous Intel chip. Okay, this is not working. So if you look at this part of the slide, so you, you actually write your program. There is something called instruction set architecture. If you have heard about x86 machine, R machine, and your program eventually gets executed in your processor. But there are many things that are hidden to the programmer. Okay, and those hidden mysteries actually try to improve the different metrics of interest that we talk about, like performance, power, blah, 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 right? So the microarchitecture part is this part, which is not exposed to programmer, but they do all the fancy stuff to make sure that your programs run fast, your program is actually, uh, you know, running on laptop or mobile, blah, 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 right? So if you look at the entire computing stack, you will find microarchitecture is at the lowest layer in the computing stack. Okay, so that's why when Kabi said, you know, we, we do all the heavy lifting, right? Because we believe that uh, software writers are dumb, no offense to any software writers, right? Because we don't expect them to understand all the mysteries that are there inside a processor, right? So we assume whatever is there here, that's our bread and butter every day, if not bada pav, and then try to optimize it, right? <laughs> irrespective of programming language, irrespective of compiler, irrespective of OS, right? You just throw whatever you want to throw, we'll try to optimize, keeping the trade-offs in mind. So now the question is, you know, in the age of AI and ML, why someone should, you know, break his or her head in this world called microarchitecture, right? Yeah. Computer architecture is there from the last 60, 70, 80 years, People have done all kinds of innovations. It's kind of a done deal. Let me write my next AI algorithm, which will do all the fancy things, right? The key is somewhere here. By the way, any guess who is this guy? Yeah, Name is there, but <laughs> <laughs> obvious is not obvious, right? So uh, any contributions that you know from this guy? So he's a Turing ordinal. That's a hint. No? Okay, go and search for it. Okay, you'll find many. Because he's not uh, famous for only one thing, he has done many things. Okay, including, uh, I, I think he was the first uh, pioneers to get into the, the world of desktop computing with uh, graphics user interface. Okay, anyway, but the key here is uh, if you look at this quote, he says, People who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. Right? And uh, so 
If that's true, then hardware is the new software, right? But is this just a philosophical statement or industry is really going for it? All of you know that, okay, Intel processors are there, AMD processors are there. They are coming up with Intel Core i3, i5, i7, i9, whatever, whatever, whatever. They are improving the performance. You are buying them. Okay. What's new in the market? All the software companies are now hardware companies. So Facebook is now designing CPUs. Amazon is designing CPUs. Microsoft, Google. Who else? Apple. Apple. Apple has been, okay. Yeah, Apple. Yeah. Although Apple is a system company, even Apple, right? Maybe for the next talk, I should add Apple here. Thanks. Right? So, which means uh, this is indeed an exciting topic because everyone is jumping into it. All the big ones are here. So, we should stop listening to people who say microarchitecture is dead. Now, with that context, let me start with uh, some of the questions that we have been asking. Uh, we meaning me and my students. So, we'll assume that we have a program that is running in our latest Intel CPU server or desktop. And uh, We'll pick an application which everyone uses, web search. And let's assume we are running that web search on an Intel Haskell processor. Let's say the latest Intel CPU. Cool. Now comes the trade off points. So if you look at this particular chart, which is called a pie chart, it shows uh, a keyword called bottleneck. If you look at the limiting factor of the bottle, it's the neck of the bottle, right? So for CPU, the limiting factor is. I need performance, assuming I'm a software programmer, right? I'm a software writer. I need high performance. Parallelism. Sorry? Parallelism. parallelism. Parallelism, okay, but what exactly you get out of parallelism? What does it what does it mean finally? So you get more work done. More work done. So the technical word is throughput. Right? You can pump more and more things in less amount of time. Right, and this is limited by two fundamental terms called latency and bandwidth. If you want to do something, you have to pay the price. That's the latency. You know, each task will take some time, and bandwidth is how fast can you do it. That that depends on how many such compute units you have, how many resources, how much uh, faster resources you have, and blah blah blah. Okay, so if you look at uh, this particular pie chart, this shows that. When you run the Google's web search on an Intel Haskell machine, there is almost 50% bottleneck comes from two different things. One is called backend memory. If you don't understand what is backend, it's okay. If you understand memory, all it's pretty fine. And then there is a bottleneck called retiring bottleneck. Okay. So in the next few minutes, we will try to understand what these two bottlenecks are and how to mitigate these bottlenecks. Okay. So these bottlenecks are there even with uh, caches. If you have heard about cache memory in your processor, right? Yeah. So which means uh, whatever you have learned in your undergrad architecture course or organization course, they are there, but they are still not useful. Okay. So 50% of the bottleneck coming from two things, we'll try to understand them, right? So to understand what is called a backend memory, let's understand how the processor is uh, interfering with what is called memory. Yeah. So this is a processor. Let me unzip it. Oops. Yeah. So if you can see, this is, I guess, yeah, this is Intel Core i9. Okay. Uh, not the latest, but still, you know, good enough. Three, four years old. Okay. The funny part is, this chip doesn't have what is called a DRAM. Right. So this, these two guys are, they're not friends. Right. Although they talk to each other almost every minute. But still, they are not friends. Okay. So now the bottleneck comes because for every program that you write or run in your processor, you have to get your data from this memory. Okay. And since this DRAM is not inside this chip, it takes longer to get that data. Right. So what you do, you put caches which are faster memory. The trade off is capacity and latency here. So you will be able to put multiple levels of caches, few kilobytes, few megabytes, but not in terms of gigabytes or terabytes. And the latency will be like few nanoseconds compared to hundreds and thousands of nanoseconds. Okay. So now our goal should be if we can keep all our data, uh, data and instruction in these caches, then this problem is solved. You won't go to memory. You won't wait for data. 
this architecture world is done, right? So I would spell out something more here. So the processor actually demands instructions that is called the front end side. Most of the programs that you will write, if you look at the size of the binary, they're in few hundreds of KBs. So they will put it into one of these caches. But the data that you need, that's called the backend of the processor. Most of the time you deal with GBs, right? And GBs won't fit into any of the caches. So which means you have to go to memory, right? And that's where the bottleneck comes, right? So when I say there is a backend bottleneck in the previous case, this 20% is coming from the backend bottleneck. You are not getting your data in one of these caches, you are going to memory. Is that clear? Okay. The other bottleneck is called the retiring bottleneck. So this is pretty interesting. What happens in modern processor is they try to, you know, get parallelism by, by doing many things at a given point of time, right? So if you understand the notion of instructions, it's fine. If you don't, it's also fine. So these are different uh, tasks that your processor is doing. And modern processors, what they do, they actually try to do many things at a time. So that you'll get, you know, higher throughput, high performance. So in this case, there are like five instructions which are entering into your processor pipeline. If you understand them, if you don't, it's fine. And each of them have different latencies, okay? So if you're going to DRAM, you're taking 300 cycles. If you're getting hit in the caches, like few tens of cycles. And if it is non-memory instructions, like addition, subtraction, blah, 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 it's just one or two cycles, right? The point here is the processor will fetch all these instructions, try to execute them out of order so that parallelism will be exploited. But finally, the catch is because the compiler or the programmer doesn't aware or it's not aware of all the mysteries that you are doing, it will try to leave the pipeline or the processor in the same order in which it entered. So what it means is like this instruction two and five, they are taking only one cycle, but they won't be able to leave the pipeline unless this guy is done which means indirectly this guy is the limiting factor, right? So this is called the retiring bottleneck. So these guys are ready to retire, right? But the previous instruction is a costly one because of which it is preventing the others to retire from that pipeline, okay? So with those two uh, bottlenecks in mind, I'll go a bit faster now. The problems will be solved if I have a multi-level CAS hierarchy but my first level cache gives me a 100% hit rate. Like whenever I demand for data, the data is there inside the L1 data cache. No need to go to memory, people will stop buying memory. But maybe initially you need it just for the OS. OS will load your program into the memory, but after a few accesses, you are done. Right? Is it possible? If I increase the size of L1 to memory, then this will become GBs. Then this will take hundreds of nanoseconds, right? The trade-off was I should get my data faster so that my processor won't wait for or starve for my data, right? Okay, so there is one way through which we can actually strive to get this 100% L1D hit rate. So D is for data. So it's a data cache which, which keeps cache, uh, which, which keeps data closer to the processor, uh, but it is pretty tiny in size. It's in few tens of KBs, okay? So one way to do that is what is called a prefetcher. Okay, so this is a small micro architecture unit which sits beside your CAS and it does all the AI ML things that you have learned, right? To understand what will be the future accesses that will come from the processor and it will fetch those data into the L1D CAS before time. That's why the idea is prefetch. You fetch it before time, right? So if you have a prefetcher which is 100% accurate and it can cover all the misses, then we have the ideal world, right? No need of L2 and L3 cache, no need to go to DRAM. So this will be the bottleneck. I said retiring bottleneck is a problem, but if I have a prefetcher that bring everything into L1 cache, now all the memory accesses will just take five cycles. So retiring bottleneck is gone. Now the problem at hand is to make sure how we get 100% hit rate at L1, okay? And what will be the approach? So the approach that I do or many of the micro architects in the community do, you know, they, they try to look at this problem at a microscopic view, okay? What's a microscopic view? So looking into each and uh, uh, every atomic 
interactions that happen in my processor. Okay, and if I understand those interactions, how do they talk to each other, then I'll be able to understand the bottlenecks properly, then I'll be able to come up with solutions which can mitigate those bottlenecks. So uh, the idea here is a prefetcher, and this guy sits beside a CAS, so the sign of the dollar is actually for CAS, and what happens here is, this guy looks at all the requests that comes from the processor, requests in the form of addresses. So the program generates addresses, right? If you do printer ampersand A of I, that's actually an address, right? So this guy will look at that address and say, okay, what will be the data that is needed for that address, right? And try to fetch it from the memory, put it into CAS, so that in future, when you ask for it, you will get a hit. And as long as you get CAS hits, you are done, right? The problem is solved. The problem that we started looking at, this is sometime in 2018, almost six years back, so all the research labs and academia, they were working on L2 prefetchers. So L2 is actually the next level CAS prefetcher. They are well known, then L2, then L3, right? And the reason being, if you want to design a practical L1 prefetcher that any of these Intel, Intels and AMDs of this world will buy, you need to be extremely lightweight because the CAS is anyway a few KBs. So the, the prefetcher can't be of MBs and blah, blah, blah. You can't put your AI ML logic. And it should be high performing at the same time. Okay, so these are the trade-offs. You need a prefetcher which will be extremely tiny, but it should be able to deliver high performance, which means it should be able to deliver high L1 hit rate. Okay, so we started asking these questions. We interacted with uh, all the labs, various research groups, and the answer that we got sometime in 2018 is, it's a futile exercise if you want to design an L1 prefetcher. You should not do that. You should instead focus your energy on designing a high performance L2 prefecture. But we said, no, we'll do L1 prefecture, like no matter what, right? And uh, this is what we came up with sometime in 2020. Uh, you know, th this is the COVID time. So this is a work done by uh, my intern, called, uh, his name is Samuel. He is currently at uh, Texas a and And we said, we will design L1 prefecture and we'll make sure it's lightweight and it is outperforming all the other prefetchers. okay? I won't go into the details of this idea, but this is the summary. So these are the flagship uh, conferences in uh, computer architecture community. They are like conferences that happen every year. These are the ideas. If you look at the trade-offs, this is the storage over it. This is the performance improvement that they provide. Make sure you understand the difference here. There is no K here. K stands for kilo, okay? So the previous best was taking around 100 KBs per processor, giving 43%. This guy is not even taking one KB, right? And beating it by 2%. That's why I said in the beginning of the talk, 2% matters, okay? So now all the people that were saying, oh, this has to be lightweight, it's lightweight. It should be high performing, it's high performing, right? So. If you, if you are curious about this 2% improvement, th this is the story that I uh, tell at least all of my students. These are actually famous quotes from famous microarchitects. So if you go to uh, companies like Intel, AMD, Apple, IBM and all who design processor, they spend years to get 1% improvement, years. So they have dedicated prefetching team where they spend three years to get 2% improvement. Okay, it's hard, right? That's why compared to other areas of computer science here, if you get a dent here and there, it's a big deal for them because finally, you know, if you look at the processor market, that's where their revenues will come. If you sell to Google saying, okay, my processor is 2% faster. So which means now the Google data centers will run 2% faster. And Google data centers is about millions of processors. It's not only one. This is one core giving 2%. You put 1 million of them, you know the answer, right? Okay, assuming you are convinced, we'll now push the limits. We'll try to make it better and better. Any questions? Her question was, how did I able to, you know, get all this performance with extremely, uh, you know, tiny storage? Uh, so the answer is, if you follow cricket, you will get this kind of answers, this kind of approach, okay? So if you, if you look at any cricket team, you have different players, they have different average, Right? They have different skills. Someone is opener, someone comes after two wickets, right? And they have their different utilities, right? So the way we propose this uh, prefetcher is, 
instead of trying to design a single prefecture which will actually let's say like a Virat Kohli of every day, we said okay let, let's have let's say your Subman Gill, bit of Rishabh Pant, bit of who is the new guy? Du, what's his name? Subham Dubey, yes, right? So uh, long story short, there is no single prefecture that can understand each and every program of this world. So instead of trying to design one, you try to create a bouquet of tiny, tiny prefectures and they do awesome stuff when they understand that part of the program, they don't care about the rest of the program. So are you saying that previously a prefecture used to be a monolithic art? Exactly. Architecture and you said that no, let's let's break it up and let it respond to the data. Uh, let it respond to the accesses. To the accesses. accesses. Yeah. So you characterize different kinds of accesses. Exactly. So the so the so the yes. So the research paper actually classifies those accesses, keeping compiler architecture in mind. And finally it argues that if we have this kind of tiny, tiny agents who are working as a team instead of an individual, they do wonders. So are these Instruction sets or are they different pieces of hardware? These are different pieces of hardware. So, so this is like extra 800 bytes sitting beside your CAS. So let's jump to next part, right? So what happened next? Post 2020, the entire community started looking into L1 prefectures. Intel started looking into L1 prefectures. All the top universities in this world, they started saying, oh, okay, now we can design L1 prefectures. Right? Okay, let's go for that. What about me and my mentees? What should we, you know, this is the COVID time, by the way. Everything was done remotely. Okay. So he said, okay, everyone is talking about performance, but what about energy? Everyone understands the notion of energy. If not energy, at least power. Right. So if, if you think about a data center, the data center used so many processors. And finally, the electricity bill is driven by your energy consumption of your chips or the processors. Right. So we said, okay, no one is talking about uh, energy consumption of prefectures, and uh, let's start looking into it. So this is something that one of my MS students at IIT Kanpur uh, proposed. Now she is a PhD at EPFL. So the idea here is, if, if you understand or if you don't know what is energy and the processor connection, so energy has two parts. One is called dynamic, one is called static. Okay, dynamic energy meaning your processor is doing some work, so it's consuming energy. Static energies, even if your processor, memory and cache, they are not doing anything, still electricity is going there, still voltage uh, levels are actually pretty high. So you will consume energy. That is called static energy or leakage energy. So even if your processor is sitting idle, your laptop is on, it is still consuming power. It's not for free, right? But how does prefetching help here or how does prefetcher comes into picture? So what most of the companies do, they have a technique, pretty awesome technique called power gating. So the notion of power gating is, so this, this is the processor, this guy sends request to memory. So if your program is not memory intensive, which means it's not going to L2, L3, blah, 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 the cache will actually go into a sleep mode. What does it mean? It means that suddenly the circuits will stop receiving voltage signal saying that okay anyway we are not getting any request there is no point consuming power let's sleep right and that is called the power getting mode with that you will be able to reduce the leakage power of a chip okay now what happened with prefetchers now this is a pretty interesting insight that no one actually came up with before so you know the processor is sending request to l1 cas l2 cas is not getting any request if l1 is providing hits this guy will sleep, okay, so that your static power consumption will be improved. But now if I put a prefetcher here, this guy tries to understand what's coming from the processor. And in the meantime, it sent request to the L2 CAS, L3 CAS and memory saying, okay, I need data for these addresses. And it becomes really aggressive because this guy's goal is to provide L1 hit rate of 100%. So it overdoes, you know, it actually tries to prefetch hundreds of things even if 10 or 20 are useful, right? So the moment this guy sends more and more requests to this CAS, this CAS can't sleep now, right? So this has to operate in a high power mode instead of a low power mode, right? So again, these are the conflicting trade-offs, right? I started with the notion of trade-offs. 
So here the trade-off was, this guy was supposed to provide high heat rate to improve performance, but what is the cost? Now suddenly it's increasing my power consumption, silently, without telling me anything, right? So what we did is pretty simple, that people were aware of it, but uh, they didn't know how to solve it. But before going into the idea part, to model these numbers or to understand these interactions, there was literally no tool available in the market. The problem here is you need to design a next level CAS and prefetcher, which can properly give you the power numbers along with the performance numbers. It should be accurate, otherwise everything will go for a toss, right? So we talked to industry folks, had multiple meetings, every time my student presents to Intel folks, they'll say, okay, looks good, but still not good enough, okay? It continues for 10 months during COVID time. One fine day, they said, yes, this looks closer to what we do. So the, the message here that I want to uh, communicate here is research in general, you know, it, it's a pretty uh, bumpy ride. You know, there will be ups and downs almost every day, if not every week, and you need to persist. So the, where, where is the problem or how exactly we address this problem? So prefetching as a problem or a research problem has two uh, attributes. One is called coverage, which means what fraction of misses are covered or that became hits. And the other metric is called accuracy. Like how accurately can you prefetch those addresses that will come in the future, right? And uh, of course, there is no such prefetcher, neither in industry nor in academia, which can give you high accuracy, right? 100% of accuracy. So if your prefetcher is not 100% accurate, so which means you are sending junk requests to your next level CAS, which is increasing your leakage power consumption. What we proposed is a new way of looking at prefetching, keeping energy efficiency in mind. And the idea is if I have this two different load requests, load request meaning requests which are going to memory, okay? So you can imagine these are like your matrix accesses, A of I, B of I, blah, blah, blah. One guy is getting a L3 cache miss, which means it's not there in L1, not in L2, not in L3, it's going to DRAM. That's why, that's why it's taking around 150, let's say nanoseconds. Someone is getting a hit in the L2, it's taking, let's say 15 nanoseconds, okay? We said, okay, let's not preface for this guy. Anyway, this guy will get a hit in the L2. My costly accesses are accesses that are missing in the L3, right? So instead of prefetching aggressively, I decided that I will prefetch pretty conservatively, but I will prefetch for those addresses which are crucial for performance. So if I convert this 150 to 10 or five, then I'll get a significant boost in my performance compared to if I convert this 15 into five, right? there's a 10 cycle difference. So that's the idea. So this idea was not new. You know, this idea was there in the community from last 30 years. What we proposed is a simple idea which can be implemented on a real processor and which can be, which can help you to identify what are those accesses which are extremely critical and how can we prefetch only those accesses and not the other ones, okay? So again, I won't go into the details, but I'll go to the trade-off now. So we, we started with this idea, and this idea gives around 45% improvement, but the energy is now 50% extra, okay? Now, we came up with this idea. This takes extra 2.5 kilobytes, again, trade-offs. Performance goes down because I'm not prefetching for all the loads. Power reduced by 5%. Now you'll say, oh, only 5%. Right? I said 2% is more than enough for me. 5% is like I'll throw party, right? So, but now, now if I look at here, they like the same group proposing two ideas with two different stories, right? Whatever I proposed here, I'm going down now, right? So what is the next question? The next question is, I can't afford to lose 2% that I got after working hard for three years. And at the same time, I don't want to consume additional energy because you know my you know, data center companies like Google and all, they won't buy my idea, right? 
So what's the way or what, what is the philosophical way of asking the question? The question is, can I have a prefetcher which is by default energy efficient and high performing? So in that way, my trade-offs will be all ticked. So this is something that I worked with an intern. He was supposed to be an intern. He could not come to India uh, because it was again COVID time. So this guy is now a postdoc in Spain. And uh, again, this work was done during COVID time. Everything is remote. Okay. So let's understand the problem now. So what people were doing so far, including me, my prefecture will look at all the requests which are coming from the processor try to understand the access pattern. You know, if there's an array, I will do something. If there's a linked list, I will do something. If there's a graph, I will do something, right? We said, okay, nothing doing. This is like good enough, but still, you know, it's not good enough for what we want. We started asking the question in a pretty simple, simple way. We said, every time this guy gets a request, let's say the request is X for address X, what should I add to this address and prefetch so that this guy will get a hit in the future? Is the question clear? The question is, what should be the delta that I should add to my address so that the future request will get hit? Pretty simple question, right? That's what we asked. We call this D as delta. And we, now our job is to you know, find out how to learn these deltas for all kinds of programs. So if you, if you, sorry. Delta is application dependent. It's application dependent, exactly. And problem dependent. Yes. And it depends on the. It depends on many factors actually. Length of the sequences of code which are running. Uh, not the code, but uh, I'll give you an example. Maybe that will, that will help you. So I hope everyone will understand this for loop. So if you try to understand memory accesses, so this is an array that will generate load request to memory. This is also another array that will generate load accesses. But if you look at uh, this part of the code, here the accesses are C of 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, sorry, C of 0, C of 16, C of 32, blah, blah, blah. But here, if this condition is true, then only you do this access, right? So the delta for this load address is different from this load address, right? So you can't have a global prefetcher that tries to understand a delta that is unique for every program. That there is nothing uh, such delta which is available in any program. So the deltas are unique to each instruction, each load instruction. So now what we did, we said for every load instruction, go and learn their equivalent deltas dynamically at the runtime. Runtime meaning when the program is running, the processor is having its prefetcher inside chip. The prefetcher is trying to understand for this load, what will be the best delta? For other load, what will be the best delta? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, what we did initially is, there is actually a prefetcher which is already there in the Intel machine that does what we are trying to do. So if you look at this particular for loop, you can understand the notion of strides or deltas, right? Plus one, plus one, plus one, right? Pretty good. Uh, your prefetcher will say, okay, go and prefetch A of eight, A of nine, A of 10. So that I'll get cash it, right? But as I started uh, this talk saying, my processor is like Mumbai or Bangalore traffic. It's out of order. Which means even if you have written this code, your cache and memory may get request in this order. So now these deltas are not predictable. Plus two, minus one, plus two, plus two, plus one, minus two. What do I do? And as I said, this, this is dependent on the load like which particular data structure that you are using for every load, the access pattern is different. So what we propose is an idea called Bertie. The idea is for every load request, you try to find out the delta and the delta that you can actually be able to prefetch on time. Okay, I, I'll explain what, that, what exactly I meant by on time. So remember the memory hierarchy picture, there are like processor, L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache and memory, right? each having different latencies. Now the problem so far was the community was assuming every time you try to fetch something into my L1 cache, the time is kind of constant, okay? So it's like they were assuming the ideal world where you send a request, you get a response and it's a constant latency, okay? But the real world is, so this is actually from a real four core processor, your prefetch latency varies from 20 cycles to 2000 cycles. 
cycle is just a unit of time, you can assume 20 nanoseconds to 2000 nanoseconds. So which means, now I, I wrote my program A of i, my prefetcher says, okay, I will prefetch A of i plus 1, but to prefetch A of i plus 1, it may take 2000 nanoseconds. Okay, which means even if your prefetcher is accurate, it won't be able to hide that latency, right? It won't be able to get the data into the L1 cache on time. So uh, why it happens? The summary is the memory hierarchy is out of order. Not only the processor, so there are multiple queues in the memory hierarchy. The memory tries to handle requests out of order again to improve throughput, parallelism and whatnot. And that's why the latency numbers that you have studied in your textbook, they're all wrong. So now what to do? What we need to introduce is a notion of time. So when we prefetch, we should ask if these are the requests that I'm getting. And if I want to convert this future request into a hit, when exactly I should start prefetching? Should I start here, 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 or here? If I start here, then the delta is three. But if I check how much time it takes to prefetch, it will say that, oh, okay, time to fetch this address 15 is this much, which means I, if I want to cover this miss into hit, I should prefetch something before seven. If I prefetch after seven, this won't help me, even if you are accurate, right? And so this is the idea. So we actually stored all these deltas for every load instruction and then try to ask when exactly I should trigger my prefetch request, keeping all these uncertainties in mind. Overall, this idea provides high coverage. As I said, this is a trade-off what fractional misses you will be able to cover. And then it also provides high accuracy, which means your energy consumption will go down dramatically because now you, you no longer send requests which are junk. Whatever you send, you are pretty sure that they are accurate. Storage overhead is again pretty low. So if I look at uh, all the overall story, so this, this improves the previous idea that I proposed by 3.5%. And the accuracy is almost 90%. This is the only prefetcher in the market that provides 90% accuracy, right? And the energy is just 11%. So if you look at the bigger story, this 50 became 11. It's a huge jump. 45 became 48.5. So 3.5 here, almost 40% here. It's a win-win situation, right? So now I have a prefetcher that solves all the trade-offs that I have started with, right? All good. Any questions here? So her question is, what is the trade-off of Bertie? So Bertie as a prefetcher, the only limitation is it tries to learn how much time will it take to get the data into cache. It learns it dynamically. And that's okay for a four core, eight core system. But later we found that it's not a good, good solution for a large core system. I'll talk about that. This is compiler independent? Yeah, this is compiler independent. Yes, exactly. So this is one prefetcher. This is completely compiler independent. But could you do something which is uh, married to the compiler where, where certain information is being relayed? Huh. Now, say, yeah, 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 yeah. We are on that. We are on track. <laughs> so, so there are a few things where hardware prefetchers can't do anything. There are a few things where software prefetchers, if they try to do something or the compiler tries to do something, it will bloat uh, memory requirement and blah, blah, blah. So you need a jugalbandi, right? A handshake approach. But you'll say, okay, I'll do something, you do something, and later we'll be happy. But yeah. is this improvement translatable across codes? Because most, most way we write code is not, is not uh, conducive to running on multi -corpus. No, these are single threaded, they are like single threaded softwares, each running in uh, different cores. Right? This is not for multi threaded cores. So, this is on a per core basis. Per core basis. But since it's a per core basis, it has its own scaling effect. Now, every core gets 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%, right? Yeah. Okay, so the message that, that comes out of this uh, particular idea is you have to keep pushing the boundaries, right? Because you don't know. You Still, you haven't received your 99% or 100% hit rate, right? Now this is something interesting, I will spend few minutes here. So far we have been talking about single core machine or we are trying to understand what exactly is limiting in a single core execution when you run a program on a single core. But our real systems are multi-core or many core. Which means, so I have 
64 cores, 64 L1, L2, L3 CAS, tons of DRAMs, but not 64. Okay, so if you count here, these are like 2, 2, 4, 2, 6, 8, right? Can anyone guess what's the problem? Sorry? Cash no, this is not about cash. So see, he said cash coherence, but here I am saying each application is running on a particular core and they are independent. Okay. No, so that's what I am saying. They are independent. They are not friends. Okay. So they are running in isolation. So imagine you are running 64 different, let's say GCC, YouTube application, some, some, you know, MATLAB code, blah, blah, blah. All are independent. No need to compute. They have their own local L1, L2 CAS, and there is a notion of local L3 CAS also. Okay. But the DRAM is not local. No, DRAM is not local. So can that be localized? It won't be, right? DRAM is not sitting inside the chip. Think about it. What's the problem? Answer is there in the slide. Not enough DRAM. Sorry? Not enough DRAM. Not enough DRAMs. Exactly. Right? So if you look at it, I have 64 cores, but I have only 8 DRAMs. So this is called DRAM channels. Channels are nothing but you know, the communication uh, unit that transfer data from DRAM to CAS. So I have only eight such channels in a 64 core system. Okay, which means now all of these cores when they start sending request, what will happen? Throughput, can, can, can you be more specific? Bottleneck, yeah, obviously. What kind of bottleneck is this? Bandwidth bottleneck. Right, you need data at a faster rate, but you don't have enough actors sitting inside DRAM to pump data at the same rate. For a single core, let's say if I put only core zero here and there is one DRAM, all good, right? This guy send request, this guy send response, all good. So what if you segment the cores? People have tried everything. So th there are many optimizers that try to you know localize few things, few cores, few controllers, blah blah blah. Segment the DRAMs. Uh, that's indirectly there. So the way these are addressed, there, there is a notion of segments. Okay. But okay, the takeaway message here is the DRAMs are not scaling the way you are scaling your course. Okay. And now if you look at what happens, so remember the prefetcher Bertie, right? So the y-axis source performance greater than one is actually improvement. So 1.3 meaning 30% improvement. So if I am running a 64 core system, and if I provide 64 DRAMs, my Bertie prefetcher is giving me 35% performance. But same Bertie prefetcher, if I am giving four DRAMs for 64 cores, forget about improvement, it's giving me 20% degradation. It's below one. If I provide eight DRAMs, still it's degrading by 16%. Post 16 cores, there is some improvement, 20%, blah, blah, blah. So all the story that we have been discussing so far from the last 40, 45 minutes, that okay, we improved by 2%, 3.5%, become 45%, blah, blah, blah. When it comes to data center processors, gone, right? So you will say, okay, is this a real problem? This is indeed a real problem. If you have a 64 core server in your you know, lab or home, you will find that this is the problem. This is like, you know, Hundred of hundreds of monkeys trying to eat one banana, right? So they, they will just fight, fight with each other. Finally, no one will get in, right? And so the crux here is the bandwidth per core drops drastically, and since the bandwidth drops, it creates a latency problem. Since you are not able to pump the data that which you know the rate at which you are demanding, suddenly it will create delay. Mumbai traffic again, right? Even if you have four lanes, five lanes. If you have 60 cars for four lanes, it won't be enough, right? Okay, so that, that's the problem. You know, the bandwidth or reduction in bandwidth becomes a latency problem, right? Again, trade-offs, right? So the goal here should be to reduce the traffic at the DRAM. So as a, as a designer who is designing prefetcher, you should not make things worse because already this you know, entire system is messed up, right? So th these are the things that you should try to do. What we did is we try to argue that, okay, whenever you find something inaccurate, inaccurate, you drop it. And remember the notion of energy efficiency, I said there are few loads which are critical 
they are actually going to DRAM, just prefetch for them. We, we did something similar here, because if I start talking about this idea in detail, it will take an hour or so. So th this idea actually came uh, last year uh, in uh, one of the top conference called Micro. And the idea is this. So the name of the idea is Clip. What it does, for every prefetcher, you put a small structure and ask for a given access whether I should go ahead and prefetch or I should drop it. Because anyway, things are not looking good. And when do you say yes? You say yes if you know that that particular load request will be critical, which means it will actually miss at the L3. If you don't prefetch, it will be a big you know loss. And the corresponding prefetcher can indeed prefetch this address correctly. If these two conditions are satisfied, then only you prefetch, otherwise you drop it, don't prefetch. So you, you will be surprised by knowing that for certain applications, the solution is just don't do prefetch. And if you go and look at some of the blogs from Google research, Google research says, okay, if you are using a 64 core server, turn off your hardware prefetchers because they will make it worse. Okay. So this paper was actually the first work that tries to argue, no, you can still do prefetching on a many core system. And if you do this, you know, if you use this particular filter, it will be good enough even in many core systems. Okay, bigger story. So again, few more KBs here, but this KBs are on top of uh, this previous paper. Minus 24% to start with, it became plus 8%. It's a big jump, at least for me, if not for you. Okay, final few slides, because I have to talk about security. So from last almost 40, 45 minutes, we have been talking about performance, energy, throughput, bandwidth, latency, forget about it. All the processors are now being attacked left, right, center. What does it mean when I say attacked? You know that, you know, you know there are attacks on network stack, there are attacks on OS. Now there are attacks on Intel processors. So this is the famous Intel inside advertisement, right? So this advertisement has been replaced by famous attacks. So I, I don't know whether you are aware of it. So there are like tons of attacks that came in last uh, six, seven years. What does it mean when someone says your cache memory can be used for mounting an attack? Any guess? It protected Leaking protected information. Pretty good, right? So. The question here is, whatever we have discussed so far, processor, CASs, prefetcher, DRAM, can they leak information? Can they leak sensitive information? To whom? Sorry? Who is the attacker? Programmer. Programmer, right? Yeah. So basically think about a data center, think about a cloud where many users are running, where finally your CAS is said, finally your DRAM is said, right? Is it possible to get some sensitive information which is not supposed to be leaked, right? You are running something on a cloud. I'm also running something in the cloud. We don't know finally whether our DRAMs are shared, the way it's in the cloud. And suddenly you know my uh, bank details, right? Okay. So this is how cache memory can be used to uh, cause information leakage. Let's say there are two processes, okay? They're like two malicious process. They want to play a game and they want to communicate information. So information can be like simple zeros and ones. So if, if you don't understand the organization of CAS, it's fine. But the idea is how can two malicious process communicate through CAS? This guy will actually thrash the entire CAS. So you should write a program which will demand more memory than the size of the CAS. That's called thrashing. So let's say if you have written an array, which will take 10 MB, but this guy is only of 2 MB, so this will thrash. Right? And this guy will come and try to check whether I'm getting cache hits or not. Right? Since this guy has already thrust, this guy won't get any cache hits. Whatever data that was there in the cache, it's all kicked out. Right? So if this guy wants to infer a covert information of one, then it can say every time I send a request to cache, if it is taking more time, then which means this guy is trying to send one. Now think about the other way. Let's say this guy is not thrashing. This guy is sending a small array access, few tens of KBs, which means rest of the cache is still having this guy's data. 
When this guy tries to access this cache, now it will get hits. Which means this guy wants to send zero. So by thrashing cache, you will be able to communicate ones and zeros. Right? So this is just a simple example. You can actually make it complicated. People have attacked the AES itself. They have extracted the key used in the AES through cache. Right? If not prefetches. Right? So this is the world of side and covert channels. Covert channel is a channel which was not supposed to be, it, it's not an intended channel, right? So I am communicating with you, it's not a covert channel, right? But if you got some information about me from someone else, it's a covert channel, right? And if you are passing some sensitive information, if there is a secret, this covert channel will become a side channel, which means if someone else knows my bank details, and that guy gives you those information, that's a side channel, right? So the world of side channel and covert channel, this is not new, it, it's there in the computing stack, but now it is there even in the micro architecture world. Whatever people have been doing from last 20, 30 years, they have been used to create these attacks. I'll just talk about prefetcher. So if I want to design a secure prefetcher, which won't leak sensitive data, then where is Bertie? This guy is Bertie, right? The best prefetcher so far, all good, accuracy, energy efficiency. Did the 11% performance drop? Right, all the five years of work, try to push 2%, 3%, 5%, 11% down, just to provide security, right? Now, this is actually work under submission, work done by one MS student here at IITB. So he came up with ideas which can actually provide a jugalbandi between security and performance. Okay, I can't disclose everything, but uh, the highlight here is not the idea, but the trade-off. And finally, if you look at these numbers, the numbers look still bad. It's like 11% drop becomes 3% drop for security, right? So I started my talk saying nothing is for free. If you want energy efficiency, there will be performance drop. If you want security, there will be performance drop. If you need scalability, everything runs well for four cores, eight cores, suddenly 64 cores, 25% drop, forget about improvement, right? So these are the things that I do, right? So this is my research group called Casper. We work on performance and security research. So the P stands for performance, S stands for security, C stands for computer architecture, okay? So go to this web page, you'll find many other interesting things. What we do, we actually try to dream the maximum extent that we can. And then we start asking the right questions to make it possible, right? So I will stop with a famous quote. I don't know who told it, but somehow I, I kind of developed it over the years. If you want to solve a problem properly, you should know the problem well enough so that you'll get the best solution, right? If you're always looking for solution, you won't get a solution. You know the problem properly, right? 101%, if you're clear about the problem, you'll get an awesome solution, pretty lightweight, pretty energy efficient, secure, scalable, blah, blah, blah. With that, I will stop. We, we can take a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't prefetches have any processing delays? No, so the, uh, okay, so the question is whether prefetching add additional delays. So the answer is no because the processor doesn't talk to prefetcher. Okay, so this is actually you know, it's a background uh, side actor. It's not the primary actor. Processor talks to CAS, CAS responds. So it's not in the critical path. It, it doesn't delay anything. Centered around like general purpose CPUs. Huh, huh. So how well does it hold in the age of the domain system like what opportunities are there? Okay, his question was, whatever I talked about from last one hour, is it applicable to domain specific accelerators? The short answer is no. So you need a prefetcher where you are designing a generic processor. That, that's a 10,000 uh, 10, feet view answer. For example, GPUs, they don't have accelerators. Uh, sorry, they don't have prefetchers. GPUs and accelerators are engines that are driven by bandwidth. You know, GPU has 10,000 threads running bang, bang, bang. Why you need prefetching? Anyway, they are doing awesome. Improve is you put more and more dim slots. So this is called slot. Right? You put it into your motherboard. So you create hundreds of slots, then the problem will be solved. But then suddenly your 
motherboard area will be huge. So the, the, they are improving. It's not like DRAM companies, because DRAM companies are different from Intel, Intel's and AMD's, right? But, but the rate at which the bandwidth is increasing every two years, right? And to make it worse, just think about when he asked about GPUs, right? So you have a many core CPU and a GPU, both are talking to DRAM. Things become even more worse.